Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Unitize 2020. This is Dan Spooler, the co-chair of the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative, and it's been a record-breaking week for Unitize, and we've been featuring some of the blockchain industry's top leaders and government officials from across the world. Uh, today, we're honored to be joined by somebody who's played a pivotal role on both the industry side of blockchain and now the regulatory side. Uh, Mr. Brian P. Brooks, the acting controller of the currency for the United States OCC. Uh, as acting controller, he is the administrator of the federal banking system and chief officer of the OCC, which supervises nearly 1,200 banks, federal savings associations, and federal branches and agencies of foreign banks that conduct approximately 70% of all banking business in the United States. Uh, also joining me today as a co-moderator for our chat is Kristen Smith, the executive director of the Blockchain Association. We have a lot to cover today, but I first want to allow Kristen to introduce herself and the work she's doing, and then we'll do the same with Mr. Brooks. Thanks, Dan. For those of you who don't know the Blockchain Association, we work to improve public policy on behalf of the crypto industry here in Washington, D.C. And as an advocate for crypto, I could not be more excited to have one of our own enter into public service and really looking forward to this converse conversation with the visionary Brian Brooks, uh, here today. So thank you for joining us. Yep, Brian, thank you, very uh, much for thank having you me. again. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you uh, join, join us today. So well, how did you find yourself really as the acting controller of the currency? And maybe you could just give us an overview of your uh, origin story. Well, you know, look, um, I, I've been in financial services at some level my whole career. And um, one thing I've seen just in the course of my my kind of professional lifetime is over time, consumer preferences change, and then technology changes, and then eventually institutions have to change with it or, or die. And so, you know, having come out of a normal banking legal practice long ago, I found myself at one point running a bank, and then I found myself investing in fintech companies. And then I discovered crypto, all of which is about sort of the evolution toward the future, right? And so, you know, banks have been our financial intermediaries for hundreds and hundreds of years, but they weren't created the way they are now, and they don't have to be the way they are now forever. So the way I would talk about crypto is crypto is really about the future of money. Money transacts through a financial services system that I regulate, and the historical way we had a financial services system was through banks. One of the things I'm really focused on here, and I know we'll talk more about that, is the idea that you know, banks and the concept of what a bank is has to evolve to meet the times. And I think crypto came about at a certain moment in time for a reason. You know, it happened just as the financial crisis was unfolding, just as there was the first inkling of a lack of confidence in fiat money, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And while the great news is that the U.S. economy remains strong and that the U.S. dollar remains kind of the central reserve currency of the world, there are more reasons than ever to believe that money has to evolve in a bunch of different ways. That's what crypto is all about. So I've been working on the evolution of financial services my whole career. Crypto was kind of the apotheosis of that. Uh, and the fact that now I get to sort of oversee the system that one day will include crypto uh, is pretty exciting for me. Brian, that's fantastic. Um, you know, for at least the past two years that I've been at the Blockchain Association, um, obviously regulatory issues have been on the front lines, and we've heard a lot about the SEC and the CFTC, um, also FinCEN, but it wasn't really until you showed up at the OCC that people started talking about it. And I, I think the point you made about um, banks needing to evolve is very important, but can you kind of talk maybe a little bit more specifically about some of the ways um, that crypto companies can interact with your agency? And what power yeah, well, do you have uh, over crypto? So, 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 Kristen, first of all, um, remember the good thing about crypto is nobody has power over it. That's the whole point of crypto. I know that's why we're all here, and I, I respect that fact a lot. Um, what I would also say is uh, one of my missions at the OCC is never to see another news story that says dot, 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 an obscure regulatory agency, the Office of the Controller of the Currency. So you all can help me dispel that, uh, that, that idea. The way that the OCC works in the ecosystem and the way that crypto companies will eventually come to work with us, I think, is we are the chartering agency for banks. None of the other agencies that you mentioned charter companies. Uh, they certainly don't charter banks, which are the central way that value is exchanged in our society. And so if what crypto aspires to be is an alternative way of transmitting value across networks versus through centralized banks, 
that has to start someplace. It has to start with the real world that exists today, and that, that's the banking system. So I think over the next few weeks and few months, the OCC is going to start speaking to crypto in some very direct ways, starting with the simple and evolving into more complex ideas. We're going to have to say, for example, what we think about national banks being able to custody crypto assets, because as you know, people who hold crypto, especially people who hold large amounts of crypto, want it custodied in a way that's safe and secure. They don't want their private keys stolen. Historically, banks have been the most important custodian for other assets. So what do we think about that activity for crypto? There's a huge issue around digitized dollars. You know, this has been a subject of central bank research uh, in England and China and elsewhere for several years now. The U.S. has had a pilot sort of a study on central bank digital currency for a while. The question is, what role should the banking system play with digitized dollars? Should, for example, banks be able to run the reserve accounts for stablecoin projects? Should banks be able to accept deposits in stablecoin? Should banks be able to accept payments of obligations and say, well, these are all things that I have to speak to because, as you said at the outset, I have to administer the national banking system. And then you get to the really interesting questions like for the other crypto tokens, for, for Bitcoin and, and other things that aren't stable value instruments, what are those things? Are, are they money? Do they have characteristics of money? Are they kind of like foreign exchange? When banks have a statutory power to deal in foreign exchange, would that include Bitcoin as something banks can deal in? These are really important questions. And for crypto to get into the ecosystem and really be seen universally as a legitimate form of unit of account, store of value, you know, means of exchange, we have to start by answering those questions in the banking system because for good or ill, that's what our financial system is today. And so I hope to look at those questions with a careful eye, with expert advice, and we will come out and give clarity to that. And we'll do so sooner than most people think. That's fantastic well, to hear. Yeah, I agree, Kristen. And you know that actually brings us to our next question, Brian. Um, last month, your office released an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on National Bank and Federal Savings Association digital activities. So for our audience and for our listeners, first of all, what is an ANPR and what are you hoping to get from this process? Well, this is a great question. You know, um, in Washington and in these regulatory agencies, there's a there's a funny sort of alternative universe of language that people use, and we have a lot of process around what we do here. But in in substance, what it basically is is a request for advice before we start regulating this area. And when I say regulate, I don't mean let's go crush it. A lot of people hear regulation and they think let's go crush and constrain. What I mean is let's create a framework with. 40 million Americans hold can be safely transacted and it can flourish. Uh, so the question is, how should we do that? And the point of the request for comment or the ANPR is, as it's formally called, is basically to tell us, first of all, what problems are you experiencing as you in the crypto world try to interact with banking? For example, have you had trouble getting a bank account? Uh, some crypto companies report that banks don't even want to handle their corporate checking account or their payroll account, let alone their stablecoin project. So if that's really true, we need to aggregate up that information and figure out how big of a problem it is and what the problem is based on. Other people will say, uh, gee, there's a set of KYC expectations or compliance expectations that our bank requires before they will allow us to transact with them. And we believe that those uh, requirements are heavier than they would be for a company that's not in crypto. If that's true. Again, we need to know that. Then the issue is what, what other needs do you have in the financial services sector that are currently not being met. I just listed several, like custody, like deposit taking, and some of these other things. But there may be others that we're not aware of. And so before we go and establish a framework, what we want to do is hear from stakeholders about what problems we need to be trying to solve. But I will say what's underneath our issuance of the ANPR in the first place is the recognition that many people don't realize, which is that 30 or 40 million Americans hold crypto today. So saying that crypto is bad or trying to put crypto back in the box is a little bit like when municipal governments all over the country seven or eight years ago said that Uber was bad and Uber needed to put back in the box. In a pluralistic capitalist democracy, if 40 million people want something, they're going to have it. And so our responsibility as regulators is to create a safe platform where they can encounter it. So why is it um, important for companies and organizations to, to respond to this, uh, this ANPR? I, I mean, I know there's been situations where uh, Regulators have put out requests uh, you know, for comments, and they haven't had a lot of response. Is it why is it important for companies to really do this? 
Well, um, it's only important if, uh, if you want me to get it right, right? It reminds me of a poster that used to be in my dentist office. It said, you don't have to floss all your teeth, only those you want to keep, right? So we put this out there and we're going to do something to build a framework. And, you know, I've got some knowledge. I worked at, you know, one of the most important crypto companies. So I know a few things. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a dumb guy. But I'm also not arrogant enough to believe that I know what all the problems are or that I understand all the different perspectives on those problems. And so I want to make sure that I get the advice I need. The only way I'm going to get that is if the people listening in on this, uh, this video chat or if others in the industry will speak out. So, so please, you know, I'm, I'm sort of begging you here. We need your advice and we need your issue spotting if we're going to get this right, because we won't have a chance to set a framework but once. And once the framework's out there, that's the, the rule the world's going to have to live with. So, Brian, you spoke a little bit earlier about um, how one of the, the OCC is the only agency that can decide what a bank is. And I know you and I have spoken in the past about this concept of a special permit uh, purpose payments charter. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Maybe um, talk about, does this relate to the ANPR that you've released and also sort of how it differs from the FinTech charter that's already been around for a couple of years? Yeah, well, that's a great question, Kristen. And um, the way to think about it is charters authorize the holder of the charter to do a set of activities on a nationwide basis. That, that's what's special about the OCC charter. Crypto companies today generally have to seek approval on a state-by-state -state basis to do any of a number of things that they do. So for example, if you're in the business of converting fiat to crypto or crypto to fiat, that's generally regarded as money transmission and most states regulate that. Turns out it's way more complicated, confusing, and expensive to get 51 licenses than to get my one national bank charter. So one, one way to think about this is uh, what is the platform that's going to allow you to go to market with whatever your crypto project is or whatever your crypto business is? You know, that's, that's, that's an important aspect of all of this. Um, the other thing about it is, is that, um, you know, the purpose of creating a national charter system, which, you know, in our agency was created in 1863, but even before that was created by my friend Alexander Hamilton here, in the, you know, the 1790s. Is that, an, is that a Hamilton bust behind you? That right there is a Hamilton <laughs> bust. And Hamilton Love had it. this idea that for the country to be a strong country, we had to be a large unified economy. Remember at the time of Hamilton, we were a collection of 13 or 14 individual sort of principalities that we called states. But there was no concept of one country called the United States. Remember, the U before the Civil War was not capitalized. The states was capitalized. So the point of our charter is to unite the country and to allow large economies to grow. Crypto, you know, if, if you believe what those of us who in the industry believe, crypto is designed to be an inherently borderless unit of exchange that unites disparate communities around a single currency, whether that's Bitcoin or ETH or some other, some other asset. And so what our charter is all about um, is to provide that platform for more people. In terms of saying what a bank is, I would just say a lot of stuff that people do on crypto looks a lot like a lot of things that people historically have done with banks, right? They borrow, they save, sometimes they spend. I mean, these are the core functions that banks have typically intermediated over the years. And over time, it's possible that networks, you know, powered by crypto tokens will play those functions. So if that's right, what I'm trying to do over here is to evolve the concept of what a bank is to meet the preferences of this generation of people who are crypto holders. Uh, and that's fundamentally what it's all about. You know, I get that I might be running the post office today and I want to be out front to adapt when email comes online. And if that's the case, I don't want to make the mistake the post office did 25 years ago and miss that boat. I want to evolve my charter to capture that and to create a safe and sound environment where networks can distribute value if that's what the future is. Yeah, you know, Brian, um, looking at other fellow regulators at other agencies, I know this really isn't under the OCC's jurisdiction, but as you know, the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets uh, has rejected a number of ETF applications dating back to 2017. And the chief cause, they say, as they pointed to, is an inability of applicants to prove that there is not manipulation in the underlying Bitcoin market. Um, again, do you think that interpretation here is overly broad, just from your opinion? And do you expect this view to evolve over time with potentially a Bitcoin ETF? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, look, I think I think facts are facts, and you know, I, I've seen some of those studies as well. Uh, you know, I remember when I think it was Bitwise did one of those studies that was looking at uh, at what the rate of manipulation was out there. I think the truth is some of this is based on the law of small numbers. You know, there aren't that many crypto transactions out there, and so it's pretty easy to manipulate that market. Versus, you know, it's super hard to manipulate the U.S. Treasury market because it's the deepest, most liquid market in, in the world. So part of this I attribute to being growing pain. So I'm not saying that the SEC's decision on those cases was the right decision or the wrong decision. But what I am saying is when you have more liquid markets, more transactions, more secondary markets and derivatives kinds of things, the ability to manipulate the market will go down. You know, that, that's that's kind of the whole point is, is to deepen and liquefy this market more than it has been in the past. I would say from the bank regulators, re regulators perspective, you know, we're not in the business of authorizing ETFs or uh, recommending investments or anything like that. We're, we're a platform provider, right? We, we create the entities through which these things can pass. And what I would just tell you about that is like, look, there are all kinds of currencies that our banks deal in every day that are more or less stable than the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, when there was alleged currency manipulation in Russia in the late 90s, or when the Asian flu brought the Malaysian currency and the Thai currency, you know, to their knees, U.S. banks still transacted those currencies. And so the question is, does this issue affect the ability of banks to transact these things if they're widely held enough? And I think the answer to that is one of the things we want to look at in our ANPR. But uh, as I say, our concerns are a little bit different from theirs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't second guess their judgment. But I also wouldn't assume that just because, you know, there was some amount of problem on day one, that there will be later. I'll just close on this note, which is in the early days of the Internet, you know, the principal uses of the Internet were bank scams and pornography. And there's still a lot of bank scams and pornography on the Internet, but there's also Amazon and Google. And the point is, we don't want to judge crypto based on the early days, because early adopters always tend to be bad guys. Over time, the value gets proven by later adopters. Um, Brian, you mentioned this a little bit earlier in your opening comments, um, but I know at your time at Coinbase, you had done a couple opinion pieces on, um, you know, sort of dollar-backed stable coins. And, and I think we've seen in Washington, um, especially since the onset of this uh, now never-ending pandemic that we find ourselves in, um, a real desire by policymakers to find faster ways to distribute large amounts of of aid to many people. Um, and um, also people are um, less eager to transact in cash just for um, concerns about uh, transmitting other things with that cash. Uh, and um, we saw both the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee hold hearings on uh, sort of what they call digital dollars. Um, I think we've seen multiple suggestions out there, everything from you know, Fed accounts that would be managed by the Fed and uh, the, the access point would be through the postal system to, um, you know, former uh, CFTC chairman Chris Giancarlo and um, his uh, digital dollar project has released a paper that sort of would call for a more uh, token based system. Uh, you know, from my perspective at the Blockchain Association, you know, we've seen a lot of private sector activity around stable coins, whether they be those that are backed by reserves or those um, that are driven by protocols. But can you um, kind of let us know a little bit about how your thinking has evolved? And do you have a position on if the Fed should issue a digital dollar now, now that you're in government? Has that changed in any way? Well, I mean, uh, with the caveat that the views I'm about to express are my own and nobody else's, um, I, I, I do have a view. And um, I guess I can best illustrate the view with two hypotheticals. So, you know, we have uh, something in this country called the Federal Communications Commission. It regulates cell phones, among other things. And imagine if back in the 80s, when cell phones were really first invented and the 90s, when they first proliferated, Imagine if we had a discussion in this country about uh, whether the FCC should build and issue cell phones to people. Imagine that just for a moment. Imagine what those cell phones would probably look like and what their features would be. I mean, that would be crazy, right? If we had a single cell phone and the government built it. That's not, that's not the country we live in. Instead, we have a proliferation of flip phones and expensive phones and simple phones for people with uh, bad eyesight. And we have iPhones and we have Android. And that's what a large pluralistic capitalist democracy can bring you is choice and optionality, which is sort of a high value in our society. And it makes all of our quality of life better. Imagine that. 
Or imagine in the 80s when the internet was first being developed. And um, you know, in those days, the principal means of communication in this country um, of written communication was writing letters. So imagine if at that time we decided, hey, you know, the processor of letters is the post office. So we think the post office should build an email system for America and it would run through the US Postal Service and all Americans can connect the computers uh, to their postal service email and have the same wonderful customer experience that we all experience at the post office. Can, can you imagine again, what that would be like? Like nobody would take that suggestion seriously. So I find myself sort of scratching my head at the idea that uh, any agency of the government, whether it's my agency or any other agency, and by the way, I am the controller of the currency. So you'd think if we were going to issue a currency, maybe it should be me. But, uh, but that's not what governments do in our society. What governments do is they build frameworks and they establish rules to protect all of us. And then they let the amazing, dynamic American economy generate options that are demanded by consumers. That's why we have such beautiful experiences you know, on high streets and old towns and shopping malls and town centers all over the country versus countries that have command and control economies. So my basic view is it's important and imperative even that banking regulators speak to what kind of collateral rules, audit standards, disclosure rules ought to apply to stablecoin projects. But we ought to then take the same approach to stablecoin projects that we've taken to all the different communications app on your cell phone. I mean, when I hold up my cell phone here, I've got like WhatsApp and I've got Signal and I've got text messaging and email because that's what the private sector inventiveness has given me, but all subject to a framework that the FCC created. That's, I think, the right interaction between government and private sector, in my view. So, um, Brian, go ahead, Kristen. Yeah. No, go ahead, Dan. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, you touched on it a little bit earlier um, about cross-agency coordination. And I had a question. Um, first, the crypto industry clearly is fortunate to have somebody with your background in this position. Have you had dialogue with fe fellow regulators on creating a comprehensive framework for crypto regulation? And, well, start with that first and then have a follow-up. Well, I, so obviously I have to be careful about private conversations I've had with my fellow regulators, but I would say um, that you'd be surprised. I, I have. And of course, uh, you know, I had had dialogue with senior officials at the Federal Reserve Board even before I worked in my current role. But since that time, I've had direct dialogue with a number of other agency heads about what, uh, what we're trying to do. And I think um, on the one hand, some people are still feeling their way on these things. On the other hand, you've heard two or three agency heads talk very directly about their desire to uh, foster the growth and provide a pathway for this industry to succeed. Uh, and then I would just say by way of teaser that I've spoken to one or two people you might be quite surprised by who, uh, who actually want to help, uh, contrary to what the industry might think. So I'm doing my best to have an open mind to learn from them as they're learning from me. Uh, but I, I think you're going to see real activity here, would be my prediction. That's that's very exciting. That is exciting. Do you think we're going to see acting Comptroller Brooks become Comptroller Brooks? Um, well, look, I, I appreciate the question. I, uh, that, that's, that's not up to me. You know, I was asked to serve and to play a role, uh, you know, for a period of time, which I'm doing and happy to do. And if the president were to ask me to serve in this role permanently and the Senate were to confirm me, that would be a bridge I would cross when it came to it. But in the meantime, uh, you know, look, this is an important job. I'm not here to occupy a seat. As long as I'm here, I'm going to try and make a difference and help grow the economy. Brian, can you talk a little bit um, about some of the other roles that you have in this job? I mean, I think you're a board member of the FDIC and you're a part of FSOC. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I mean, as Dan was saying, it sounds like you do have conversations with your fellow regulators. Can you talk about kind of the frequency um, and, and sort of the forums in which that happens? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the controller sits on a number of deliberative and decision-making bodies. And just to go through those, and then I can unpack these a little bit, but so I'm a member of the board of directors of the FDIC. So there are four directors currently on that board, and I'm one of them. Uh, there's something called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is a 10-member body consisting of the Treasury Secretary, the Federal Reserve Chair, the Controller, the FDIC Chair, and a handful of others, where we talk about systemic risk uh, to the U.S. and global financial system. Uh, I'm a member of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, which is a slightly different and smaller group of people who talk about uh, markets issues, uh, and particularly international markets issues. 
And then I'm also a member of a group called the International Heads of Supervision, which is a subset of the G20, which uh, basically are the banking regulators of the United States and the other major industrialized nations who get together on a monthly basis to talk about um, global regulatory issues, uh, things relating to Basel capital standards, um, you know, things relating to uh, money laundering issues on a global basis, those kinds of things. So the office has a lot of scope and scale, uh, which is why I say I don't ever want to hear another story about the obscure agency here. This is, in my view, <laughs> really, ever since I was a young lawyer, probably the most important agency in, in finance because of the things I just mentioned. Um, but the point is, a lot of those things have the potential to touch crypto-related projects. So, so, for example, you know, the FDIC is going to care if national banks are holding reserve deposits backing a stablecoin project. What they don't want to see is something that results in a bank run and then a bank failure that they then have to go resolve. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing where I would be talking to the FDIC over time about how we're going to plan to supervise those kinds of things. Or in this international heads of supervision role, you know, money laundering policy is a big deal. And obviously, the travel rule has been a subject of a lot of discussion in the crypto industry over the last year to 18 months. And, uh, and you know, that's a place where I find myself talking about the travel rule with my fellow uh, agency heads. So the, the point is, there are a lot of different touch points where all of this matters. Um, I, you know, FSOC would be another one where issues of global crypto and the ability to surveil transactions globally would, would get discussed in that kind of a forum. Um, no, I think that's fantastic because, um, you know, as, as you well know from being on the other side of things, it's, it's a real challenge, I think, to get uh, policymakers up to speed and to have somebody who can have a sort of peer level dialogue and, and talk about the positive aspects of the technology is, is really wonderful. Um, I want to go back in time a little bit to um, when you were at Coinbase um, and uh, you know, when, when the Blockchain Association started uh, two years ago, about the same time you started with Coinbase, I, you know, the, the most pressing issue for the industry was to get clarity on securities laws. And, and since then, we did get some guidance um, back in 2019 with sort of a long list of factors. But, um, you know, I, th I think one of your signature achievements from that time was uh, coordinating the industry and launching the Crypto Rating Council. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience and what, where you see the role of the council today um, that, that you helped create? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I, I appreciate you raising that issue. That was certainly something that uh, you know my colleagues and I were very proud of. I think one of the insights behind the Crypto Rating Council was the idea that not all great ideas um, originate in government. One might argue that not very many great ideas originate in government. I mean, again, that's what's amazing about the big dynamic American economy is it generates a lot of good ideas. And I think this was an area where there was all kinds of energy being put into these projects, you know, some of which probably raised securities law concerns, but many of which, maybe most of which didn't. And the issue was for a variety of reasons, including technology expertise and a whole bunch of other things, a whole bunch of other priorities. It was very hard for any one agency, SEC or otherwise, to say, um, yes, here's the definition of which tokens are securities. So our basic view was, look, we know more about these assets than anybody else does, and we know more about how they're sold than anybody else does. So maybe we could put together a framework and we could just put it out there and see what the market thinks about it. And if the market hates it, then it can evolve and iterate. If the regulators hate it, they can tell us that. But if not, it's better to clearly state what you're doing and then move forward with transparency than not. And I think in the end, you know, it's evolved and there have been some improvements and changes made since, since we birthed it, you know, a year ago or so. But I think it's been an enormously useful tool that out an explosion of new projects. I mean, I always think about when I came to Coinbase, we listed five assets because we weren't comfortable that any other assets weren't securities. Now I think Coinbase lists more than 50 assets because we were able to filter out the good from the bad. There were a number of assets that we and others decided to leave out because we thought they were securities or close to it. Uh, but it also allowed us to, to not throw out the baby with the bathwater, which was great. And I think there are a lot of things like that. I mean, whether it's in my world of banking or a lot of other areas where private sector inventiveness, as long as it's transparent, as long as it's clearly articulated, can be put out there and the public can judge for themselves. I, I think it's important to remember, you know, we do still live in a, I come back to it, a pluralist capitalist democracy. And that's what it's all about is if you're not intentionally breaking the law, if you're transparent about what you're doing, generally speaking, the regulators will respect that and won't punish you for it. 
Well, I think having that process was um, very important and helpful, especially since it was repeatable and, and people could see that it wasn't arbitrary. But no, I thought that was a great development for the industry. Um, I want to maybe just kind of pivot away from crypto a second. I mean, you have found yourself at the helm of this, what, 4,000 person uh, agency um, at a time that I think probably when you took the job, you didn't realize that we were going to have this pandemic situation um, and all the uh, you know businesses that are being put on hold and lives that are being put on hold um, due to do the COVID-19 situation. Um, how, how is this impacting? I mean, we, we hear so many wonderful things that you're doing with, with fintech and, you know, potentially uh, that crypto could take advantage of, but um, I mean, it, it's, it's, these are very challenging times. Can you talk a little bit about your role um, in, in making sure that we keep um, the, the economy on track here and, and be able to bounce back and recover from the situation we find ourselves in? Yeah, well, I, look, I really appreciate that uh, <clears throat> that question. You know, it's a great test of leadership to see whether you can stay on your strategy um, without getting mired in these kinds of, uh, you know, temporary situations like like we find ourselves in at the moment. And that's been a challenge for, for sure. So I would say the, the first responsibility I have in this job is to make sure that the banking system is safe and sound, right? So the first job is to make sure we don't have a cascade of bank failures and don't have a healthcare situation turn into a financial crisis. Um, and so I spend time on that every single day, uh, not, not just alone, but working with our big team of bank supervisors. Uh, you know, and we have 2,500 people who are bank examiners in this agency who are the smartest and most rigorous in that field anywhere in the world. And what I'm happy to say about that is the banking system, uh, at least for the moment, is very strong, probably stronger than it's ever been before. That's largely because of the financial crisis era capital rules and other kinds of provisions that were put in place um, you know, after our last crisis. Uh, so that's the good news. The second thing is, so, so if the first mission is making sure banks don't fail, the second mission is making sure that banks are supplying the liquidity that is demanded in a, what? Pluralist capitalist democracy. So a lot of people in this country want a lot of different things. Some people in this situation, believe it or not, want to buy houses. Some people want to refinance their mortgages. Some people in this crisis, believe it or not, want to start businesses. And so it's also my job to make sure liquidity is being supplied for those kinds of things. And that is something we do every day. There's a third function, right, which is that banks are the delivery system for all of the COVID rescue packages out there, the, the Paycheck Protection Program loans, the uh, you know Main Street liquidity facility loans, you're going out to mid-sized businesses and all of the rest. All of that flows through the banking system, at least for the moment, before crypto matures to a point where that can be the delivery system. And so um, I have to spend a lot of time on all of those things. Um, my view, however, of where all this goes and, and whether the banks will remain as safe and sound, you know, three months from now, six months from now, as they are today, has a lot to do with what we think happens uh, in the ongoing response to, to the coronavirus. And one of my big messages that I've been putting out there a lot is I'm not a doctor or a public health expert, and I don't know how to balance the risks and benefits of various approaches but I do know that one thing seems to be seeping into our decision-making in this country, which I'm very worried about. And that is the idea that there's only one thing that matters right now, and that's the coronavirus. The problem is the coronavirus will pass. Uh, there will be a vaccine or it will work its way through the system without a vaccine or whatever, but it will pass. And the people who live in this country will still be here. And it's important when we get on the other side of this, that children have still been educated, that the economy still provides jobs and livelihoods for people, um, that people have leisure and beauty in their lives. All of those things matter too. And anytime you do a cost benefit analysis, it's a multivariate analysis, not a univariate analysis. So when I look at it from the standpoint of an economic policy official, I get concerned that we think we can just turn the economy off and everything will be fine when we're ready to turn it back on. That, that will not be the case forever. So, so we need to take the economic risks seriously and not because they're risks to people's money, but because the economy is as much about people's lives as healthcare is. Yeah, no, as I sit here, uh, and Dan is downstairs at uh, the Blockchain Association WeWork, we are, we are the only ones here, though they have very good Wi-Fi today, which is why we're here. Um, but yeah, everything is still boarded up. A uh, few restaurants are open, but uh, when you take away uh, the, all the tourists and uh, the professionals off the streets, it's uh, 
a little bit scary. So I, I do hope we we come out of this okay, and um, yeah, you're able to keep uh, keep the liquidity going, and um, um, and hopefully it'll ultimately be a big boon for Bitcoin because I don't know how much money we're going to be able to print to get us out of this. But uh, we're glad. Well, glad look, you're we're, there. Yeah, we're, we're we're in the office every day. I will just say, uh, making sure that the banking system is available to do what people need it to do. But the banking system is responsive to consumer preferences and responsive to the economy. It doesn't create the economy. It's human activity creates the economy. So uh, we're here to help uh, as long as we're needed. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I know this uh, this chat certainly flew by. Um, we're, we've are we got about a minute left, but I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to speak with Kristen and I and to all everybody in the audience. I know they really got a lot, got a lot out of this. And uh, we really look forward to collaborating together in the future through this new, this exciting technological frontier that we're in. And I wanna just thank you again on behalf of the Unitas Conference and, uh, and the industry. Pleasure is all mine, everybody. Thanks for having me and good luck. Okay, and to our attendees, we will be right back. Thank you again for tuning in.